And uh, I want to welcome everybody here today. We're really excited about this project. And uh, we've got Brooke Edwards here, who is going to walk us through the first part of this presentation um, about uh, Project Metal Fab. And uh, then we'll take over on the q and I do see people are already starting to throw in some questions. We'll cover that here in a second. Brooke, if you can, let's take it over. All right, Eric, can you hear me? I can hear you great. All right, thank you guys so much for joining in on our call. Um, my name is Brooke Edwards. I am the project director for Global Site Location Industries. And we're very excited about this project today. Um, I had met this project as of the past couple of weeks. It's a new one for us and we're really excited to help them. It's kind of cool because it's, become clear to us that this is similar to a brownfield type project where you know some communities might have a dinosaur type facility um, in their community and this is a great opportunity to present that um, to the project so we're, we're really excited to see just what opportunities um, become available for the project this is a very deal motivated project so um, let's get started we'll show you guys what it's about all right, so today's goals, we're going to meet our team, learn a little bit more about who we are, especially for you first timers. Uh, we're going to do an overview of the project requirements and how we identified the project. We are going to get in depth knowledge of the project's needs and the motivations and tipping points of what this project is looking for um, between the communities. And we're also going to give communities the chance to ask questions specific to the project. Uh, open up your mic, talk directly with Pat and Eric, and just have that one-on-one -on -one connection uh, right on the call. All right, should you be here? So we sent out emails, we have social media. We really wanted to promote this project to a lot of communities, um, ones that are clients, members that are a part of our alliance. We also have trial communities, ones that are gonna be using their one free submission with us. Uh, we also have observing companies. So we have a lot of companies on here that are um, considering site location, um, consulting with us and just learning about how we help companies locate new sites. So we have them on board. Um, and then we also have observing communities. So that just communities that wanna learn more about who we are, how we work with our projects and just learn a little bit more about uh, this specific project today. So what we're going to do is an attendance poll. I want to throw this up to see if um, you have actually attended a webinar in the past. So we're just curious to learn, is this your first webinar? Have you been to a couple of our webinars this past year? Or um, just how many have you attended? What's the frequency? So I'll just give you guys a second to answer this directly. You should see a pop up on your screen. All right, can everybody see the polls? All right. All right, we'll go ahead and close that poll out. Thank you guys so much for your answers on that today. Housekeeping items. So you should already be muted. We don't wanna hear you eating a bag of chips in the background. Um, if you wanna go live and you want to talk directly with Pat, you're just gonna raise your hand and that's right on, um, it should be within your settings uh, whenever we do Q&A. Uh, ask all questions in the Q&A section. So hold your questions until the end and we're gonna be uh, opening up a lot of questions between Eric and Pat and then we'll give communities a chance to ask specific questions that come up through the course of the conversation. Um, maybe something isn't mentioned or maybe something just spurs a thought that you'd like to just clarify um, to input into your submission. So that'll be a time to do so then. And then, oh, yes, we are recording. We're gonna be transcribing. And if you have to hop off early or you have a colleague that can't make it, um, we'll be sending out the recording to communities after the call. All right, so who is on the call today? So we have Eric Kleinsorge, he's the CEO and chairman of GSLI. I'm the project director for GSLI. And then we have Pat, which is the VP of marketing and sales for Project Metal Fab. All right, so just a little bit about us. We are a site location consulting firm for companies and expanding 
uh, companies. So these are, um, we, we help companies that are looking for new facilities, new sites, and we put them into contact with communities. So we have an alliance of members that are part of our company and we utilize them as the go-to site selection experts for their area. So we're based in Dallas, Texas, but um, we have connections all across the United States that when a project comes to us saying, hey, I'm looking in this specific region, we go to our members first. Give us some insight in your area. How can you be of assistance with the assets that you have? So we rely heavily on our members um, to be able to showcase their assets, their community, um, and we love working with the members to put their sites first, um, especially if we have a project that we know that they can help. Uh, so yes, communities in the network work an unlimited number of projects. We have quite a few projects in our portal and um, we do allow non-member communities to submit on one free lead with us. So there might be communities on right now that are gonna be using their one free lead on Metal Fab and we're excited to have you. We're excited that you can um, submit some sites to Pat and that he's gonna be evaluating your area um, just the same as members would. So we have 72 active projects in the portal right now, and this is what our project portal looks like. Um, it's gsliprojectportal.com is where you can learn more about us, take a look at our portal, view our projects. And like I said, if you are a non-member, you get a chance to submit on one free project lead a year. So you can log in as a guest and submit, go through our projects, submit a site, and um, we'll be getting that to the project that you're interested in um, shortly thereafter. Also exciting news, we already have another prospect live lined up. So we're just letting you guys know about that ahead of time. It's for Project Bon Appetit. And this is a company that is a dry processed dog food company. And they are looking, it's a quite a larger facility, a 222 or 220,000 square foot facility, 500 jobs in five years, 90 jobs to relocate. They're looking at Greenfield, built to soup. Um, and all regions are considered on this. So Texas and Colorado were of high interest to the project, um, but they're very interested in regions all across the United States. So we are going to be hosting them on February 11th at 1 p.m. Really excited to have them on board. We just wanna let you guys know about it ahead of time so you can just mark your calendar. We're gonna be sending out registrations within this next week. So keep an eye out for that. All right, so Project Insight. I wanna just explain a little bit about how we got connected with Pat and this project. Um, we have quite a few different means that we go about identifying projects for our members. So one of the methods was what we call a pillar and it is a um, email nurture campaign. And so we target specific industries and just we send out a lot of emails to be able to say, hey, here's who we are, this is what we do, here's how we can help assist with any type of expansion projects and um, our services are free. So I know that we had connected with Pat through um, an email nurture campaign that we did and he requested um, to learn more about us. We got on a call and it was quickly, uh, we, we talked within a couple of days after he scheduled. So. Um, it's really exciting to learn about projects like his and whenever we have members join in, they provide us with the resources to be able to continue seeking out more projects, going to trade shows, which obviously has stopped at the time. Um, but last year and all the years prior, we attend six trade shows a year. Um, we do telemarketing, we have um, industry campaigns, and we also let communities refer project leads to us, especially if they have a company that is expanding outside of their community, then we would love to assist them with finding a new facility outside of the current community that they're in. So uh, that's how we got connected with Pat and we're really excited to help him. He's got a really cool project lined up. So this is just a couple uh, elements of the key site criteria that we're just going to talk about briefly. Um, Pat had mentioned an interest in 20,000 to 50,000 square feet for this facility. He is looking in the Southeast, but he expressed to us, you know what, we're not exclusive to just the Southeast and those states mentioned. So that's a new update as of today. He has opened up his scope all across the United States. So we're excited for members that can submit um, outside of the initial scope as well as 
um, communities that are just interested in learning more about it, but now realize, hey, I can actually submit on this. So um, that's where um, his search has broadened up to the entire United States. Time frame is six to 12 months. And he's looking at a minimum of 50 jobs in one to two years, but he's going to elaborate further with Eric on how this can actually be scalable. Um, capital investment is also going to be scalable as well, um, but minimum would be about a million. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Eric and Pat to talk more about the project and look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you guys. Brooke, thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, as we kind of dive into this project, uh, very exciting. I've enjoyed talking with Pat and learning more about the project. And the beautiful thing, like uh, Brooke mentioned, this is kind of an opportunity when I tour and go on site visits with these projects. You know, a lot of times we, we're we looking for a, a nice, pretty building that's that's either a build to suit or an existing um spec building that the community's built and a lot of times we drive right by the dinosaurs that have been sitting there and rusting out and, and trying to find um, how to reclaim that project and actually make it a job producing facility and that's one of the things I find exciting on this project is this is an opportunity uh, if we had to rename it I'd call it project down and dirty because this is about uh, um, finding the right building at the right cost, driving their costs down, as he explains about what their product, that is the most important thing. They're a U.S. company, uh, that's a big advantage for them, and um, timeliness to get their product uh, to their customer is another big advantage. So this is all about the deal. If uh, you're a community out there and you have one of these types of buildings that uh, you're trying to take from zero jobs to, to 50 plus jobs, um, this is an opportunity and, and Pat expressed to me, it's not size, uh, it's about the deal. And uh, I'll have Pat kind of explain some of that uh, as we go on. Uh, during this project, uh, I mean, during this Q&A, we've had several questions submitted. We're gonna kind of go through those first, but now's the time to kind of start flowing your questions in if you have them. And hopefully if we answer them through the Q&A that we do, um, then we can offset that. And as you are posting your questions, please remember, provide your name, your location, so I can kind of talk about and Pat can get an idea of where you are in the country and your question all in the same framework. So with that said, uh, Pat, are you? Yes, sir. You, all here. right, you are here. So we're excited to have you here and thank you for taking your time today and uh, the amount of time you spent with our team in terms of discussing your project and your needs. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us today. No, thanks for having me and, and thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, we're excited about our growth and uh, thrilled to have so much interest and opportunity to talk to y'all. Awesome. Now, Pat, why don't we just start? I always like to start by ha having you paint a picture, kind of paint a picture about your company, the products that you manufacture, and, and what are the motivations um, that make you successful when finding a site? Sure. Uh, our company is a metal fabricating company, hence the name. And our target customer is in the heavy equipment and original equipment manufacturing. And we produce products in weldments and fabrications, typically out of heavy steel plate um, one inch and thicker that's used um, on these pieces of equipment. And these are, these are non-critical fabrications. And by that, I mean, it's not aerospace, it's not medical, it's not fancy manufacturing. And we tell folks when we're meeting with them that we're typically the last stop in the North American supply chain before a company would go offshore to a low cost country. Um, that's who we're competing against. Our quality and the type of product we produce doesn't have a tremendous amount of uh, requirement to it. And our customer, <laughs> frankly, is resentful that they have to spend the money on it, but um, <laughs> they do luckily and they have to because it fits a, a piece of their, their production. And, um, the value that we bring is being a low cost provider, being American based and American owned. And the fact that we can deliver these products at a low enough cost at a fast enough turnaround that uh, they don't have to go to Asia to bring them with the eight to 16 week supply chain. We can oftentimes 
reply from beginning to end to our customers in, in two to three weeks. So it gives us a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, talk a little bit about the variance. That, I was really amazed about the variance of weights that you produce. Um, sure. So we, we produce a product anywhere from 50 pounds. And, you know, again, going into these, these are weldments and fabrications that create a counterbalance to the application of uh, the customer. So a small little uh, 50 pound weight that may be used in the elevator industry, all the way up to a half a million pound assembly of weights for the test weight industry, where your cranes and your ship and your port cranes would use to make sure their cranes are in tolerance. And we fabricate these out of steel and um, various other metal type byproducts and build them to customer suit. Um, I tell you about half of our order is production based, meaning uh, our end customer makes a number of their widgets a year and we provide a piece for each one of those widgets. The other half of that business is transactional, meaning they have a one-off demand for a 250,000 pound test weight and we'll put that together and send it out. Okay, great. So talk to us about your motivations. We kind of talked about those uh, yesterday, but what are the motivating factors of why you need to expand and, and what, uh, you know, what's going to be a, t you know, the deciding factor of where you locate? Sure, sure. So um, we are located right now in the northeast part of the United States, uh, northeast Midwest, and we service the entire country from there. Again, going back to that piece of what we do, we make a hunk of weight. That's what we make. That's it. And we're competing with, with Asia. When we move that finished widget to our customer, it's a low cost piece and every dollar in freight that goes into that to get it to our customer takes away from our competitive advantage or the advantage of competing from, from Asia. Uh, so our motivation in moving and looking for a second source or a second location for manufacture is to get closer to the next mix of customers and the next batches of supply. Uh, so from being in that, that Midwest, Northeastern part of the United States, the Southern, Southwestern, Southeastern part takes us much closer to another mix of customers um, and allows us to either deliver lower cost product because we're not putting freight underneath it or allows us to get to people who may be right by the ocean and a, a, a less expensive import piece. Uh, there's a, just a ton of variables uh, in what we do and how we make what we do to offset our cost or to create our cost structure that then projects into our customers. Yeah, what I, what I found kind of interesting yesterday, you, you I don't think you realize the sophistication in even just a, a small project like this, because it really wasn't just freight, because if other costs in a, a particular state offset freight costs, for example, if if electricity or, um, you know, labor rates or things like that offset the um, the transportation costs, then it made sense. Correct. Eric, diving into our business a little bit deeper is um the product we make is simply weight. And we take byproducts out of the steel manufacturing process, mistakes that they would make. If I think everybody's been to a, a TJ Maxx or a Marshalls and you know, here, uh, we're the manufacturing version of it, but even a step further down. Any mistake you make in the t-shirt, the, the arm, the stain on the front, we can use that raw material. And, and so in using that raw material, we get it from every possible source of steel production in the United States. And by being able to convert that to a usable weight, there are just an almost an infinite amount of variables in the raw material, in my cost of acquisition of that raw material, in my cost of bringing it into me. And so you can imagine just as variable as my raw material is, is my manufacturing process. Because every nuanced hunk of metal that we get needs to be processed or handled a little bit differently too. So that my costs on every production are different. My approach is different. So is energy important to me? Yeah, but if I've been able to find a way to reduce my freight, that offsets the cost of energy. If my labor's 
high, but my energy is low, I'm okay. If my transportation and energy are mid, but my close proximity to material is, is better, less freight in, I have flexibility. It's, it's about this mash of putting together this widget we make um, to get the lowest possible cost into our customer. And that's why, you know, to Eric, I'm sorry to interrupt, but why we have such tremendous flexibility on where we throw down roots. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was going to kind of dive into there is on the proximity to raw materials. If you're a community out there sitting um, and, and thinking about, you know, hey, we have a, uh, a linked industry here that has massive amounts of raw materials and we have good transportation. Those are two pluses. And uh, I think that's something uh, as you uh, develop your submissions uh, for Project Metal Fab is think about all those different factors that can make it a, a plus or, a, you know, drive down those costs for them. Uh, where do you currently source your materials? Where are you getting them from right now? There is not a place in the country that makes steel that we're not sourcing material. And so you can imagine, you know, think about how that what that means is, Am I bringing material out of Alabama up into the Northeast? You bet. Cost me a little more, but because I was able to buy distressed enough, it works. I'm bringing it out of Canada. Uh, I'm bringing it out of Indiana, bringing it out of any place that they make steel, we use it. And so that's why on all points of the compass, there's a, there's a piece to be considered in my input costs. And that's why we're not really constrained uh, what we're constrained by is the idea of where um, we can reduce our costs overall in all facets of the, the production process to get closer to our customer. So in terms of doing that, because we, we have uh, several smaller communities here that might not be right off of uh, an interstate and uh, they might have rail, they might not have rail. Talk to me about um, your flexibility in that. Do you have to be on a major interstate? Do you need rail? Uh, speak to that. Well, so right now, the largest major metropolitan area from us is an hour away. You know, we're still in a heavy industrial area. Um, and, and there is some proximity to, to transportation network, but we have flexibility there. Again, if I can drive cost out of my operation by being a little bit off the beaten path, that's okay. We're, we're open to looking at it. Okay, great. So this, this next question kind of dives into, and I'd really like to hear your story um, about Arkansas and the yeah. building, but um, you, you know, in terms of the size of building and stuff like that and, and anticipating future growth, tell us about the story about Arkansas first, and that'll kind of help answer this question about uh, the type of current building you're in and what you're looking for. Sure. So we started this this operation in uh, 2010, and we've had a steady, uh, really profitable growth from the beginning. Uh, early on, as we were onboarding customers, an opportunity existed similar to where we are today, where we were looking for how do we grow? Where do we look at that next bit of expansion? And we found our way to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. It was not on our radar. It was not really on our uh, place to be, and a, a building of about 350,000 square feet was proposed to us that truthfully in, in year one and a half or two of the business, we did not have the bandwidth or the vision at that point, you know, to think about, gosh, how could we do startup in two locations like this? And we passed, but it is still to this day, one of those things that we kick around our meetings, man, did we mess up and not having the vision. Um, we started looking or open our eyes to a 20 to 40,000 square foot facility in the South at that point and stumbled onto that, that opportunity that we just weren't ready to jump on. Today, we'd be ready to jump on. And why we'd be ready to go from 20 to 40 or 50,000 square feet to something of the scale of 350,000 square feet for the right opportunity is the business that we do can be scaled in a number of different directions that supports the market and the customers we have. That 20 to 50,000 square foot building is almost, um, it's an automatic that we know what exactly we're gonna do with each square feet. 
square foot, excuse me. But to have the greater space, it allows us to broaden our offering and uh, take advantage of that location. So we're open for that idea too. Perfect. So talk about uh, talk about the utility usage. Um, our cost of utilities, uh, uh, a important consideration in the facility. How much electricity do you use? I, you know, I can't give you the exact electricity, but what I'll tell you is the the equipment we're using is oxy fuel flame cutters, welding, uh, a per portable and personal welding. We're using some very rudimentary robotics and we're using um, general material handling equipment inside of our, facil our facility. So we're not a heavy demand to electric and utilities, um, you know, so that that is not really an obstacle to, to opportunity. Okay. So talk to, talk to me, uh, you kind of gave a good analogy yesterday, but how important is an, how important is an educated workforce or what level of um, uh, employees sure. are you looking for? It sounds like you've got some welders, so there's some skill involved, but talk yeah. about that a little. Sure. Right now, um, if you were to look at the skill set of every position we use, and we use from uh, non-skilled labor, on just material handling, lifting and moving, manipulating parts to our probably our most sophisticated uh, role is welding and some general basic machinists. But if you were to categorize them, one being the most entry level in that position, 10 being the most sophisticated employee, our product because of its low end nature, we're able to get away with that employee that's skilled from the one to three range. Um, certainly as supervisors, it's nice to have a little bit bigger depth, but from that everyday run of the mill employee that's going to build the team, we don't need a super educated, um, super sophisticated workforce. Uh, these are skills that are adequately trained out of regional tech centers. And uh, frankly, we've had great success pulling kids out of high school programs in the basic trades, in the welds and machinings and CAD drawing programs and bringing them right out of um, their high schools. Okay, great. Well, can you, uh, can you expand a little bit in terms of the wage levels? Do you, what do you anticipate kind of the range of wage levels for an employee that would come our, to work? I can answer that currently in that our wage ranges are in that 11, $18 an hour range uh, in North, in the Northeast and in Midwest. And we'd expect to be a competitive player. I, I think to be fair, um, knowing what type of worker we need, we often look at our, our role as a, you know, we like to keep people, it's it, it, backing up here, I'm bouncing on you, I, I apologize, Eric. But of, of our employees, we've got, uh, we've got nearly 125 in our current facility. And of those 125, I'd say 65 of those production folks have been with us near since the beginning. The balance of those folks are folks that have come in to our organization worked with us anywhere from 90 days to two years. They develop some manufacturing skills and then they go on and find other higher paying jobs, essentially taking the experience they gained from us. Um, so answering that question of, you know, where do we pay? We pay commiserate with the level of manufacturing skill we need. Let me ask you this, because I, yeah. I deal with this a lot in terms of states. Um, and these vary uh, from state to state in terms of um, assistance with job training um, and, and putting together workforce training for companies. In some of those states, you own, you know, the, the, the training program and can transfer that to other states. I learned about that in Louisiana. Uh, in yeah. some states, they just come in and they help train. It, would that be an important consideration for you? It, it's not a, a deal maker, it's a deal enhancer. Okay. Um, we've, we've typically been reluctant to take a lot of, um, of that piece simply because of the requirements, but um, you know, we're open to it. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, another, another that kind of transitions into the point. Um, when I work with uh, other site locators, uh, a lot of times they're deselecting sites, not selecting sites for clients. Uh -huh. And one of those tick points is right to work state. So if that's just a, a tick point, the site locator 
uh, doesn't look at all the other factors and they take it off and they eliminate that state uh, immediately. Um, I know of your interest in to uh, locate into a right to work state. Uh, are there other factors that could offset that if they're, um, I know you've kind of dove into that up above, but how, how critical is that to be in a right to work state? So when we talk about our business across the board, I think the most frustrating piece of our business is my answer usually starts with, it depends. And so um, it depends, you know, the right opportunity and the right offer uh, and the right cost structure to go into a business, um, we'll look at it, absolutely. Uh, it, 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 to be fair, it's, it'd be unique and it would be a, a pretty unique opportunity um, to really motivate us there. But okay. there's no reason why it couldn't motivate us. Great. So we talked about the the, the type of building. Uh, as yes, I understand sir. it, your current building, you said it had even a dirt floor in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we <laughs> we started on on ten thousand square feet, and we've since acquired uh, thirteen acres and three hundred fifty thousand square feet under roof. It's a hundred and fifty year old foundry building uh, that you know was owned by every steel magnate in the U.S. at one point or another. Uh, it's been a manufacturing facility for over 200 years. Uh, you know, certainly the environmental piece is, um, you know, always a concern. Uh, that was handled and that'll be an important piece to us that the there not be any uh, unusual or unaccountable environmental concerns. But um, from a standpoint of competitive manufacturing, my competition is located in Cambodia and Thailand and China and Vietnam. And, it, you know, no exaggeration. I have videos of my competitors with employees who are barefoot, who, you know, don't have safety equipment, who use, you know, raw dirt molds or um, water powered cutting equipment. So I really don't need a show place manufacturing facility. Perfect. And, and and we dove into this, but if somebody's if you're coming in for a site visit, they don't need to avoid bad areas or, or lower um, underdeveloped areas in their community. Crimes yeah. not as yeah, it's not a critical factor in 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 terms of things. But how important is quality of life uh, for you? Um. Yeah. So our employees, uh, are, the average commute for our current employees is about about 28 minutes into our, our facility. Uh, we are in a downtown urban environment currently in um, you know, our Midwest Rust Belt kind of city that um, has all of the challenges of an urban, urban location. Um, so we're not afraid of that um, from a, putting a place in. From a quality of life standpoint, you, know, you try to find the right employee and uh, that's comfortable in the work environment we have and uh, we're comfortable. We employ folks who are returning citizens from either uh, substance challenges or incarceration. And you know, we are flexible in that, again, given the skill type of the labor we have. Perfect. Need, excuse me. So my last question, again, we've got quite a few questions that are flowing in. Um, since you're, uh, uh, you do have steel and you do take advantage of importing steel, um, I guess you could expand if you do export uh, your product also outside of the United States, but how important or have you utilized a foreign trade zone uh, we, to this point? Yeah, we've never used a foreign trade zone. Um, okay. we, so again, um, the, the important part of the project or the product we do it's, is it's weight and it's heavy. So the less transportation, the better. And same kind of uh, thing for leaving the country or bringing material in from out of the country is the more money you put into it on the water, on the road, on the rail, the less or the more the cost of the widget has to be. So um, we're actively avoiding moving this product as much as we can. Okay. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So I'm gonna transition over to our Q&A. Uh, we'll have some good time here um, in terms of I'm just going to go start going through these questions. Our first question is from Lee Reeves. Hey, Lee, you're from, uh, she's from Monticello, Mississippi. She is a, uh, a current client of ours and a uh, recognized city. She's asking, and there's three or four uh, people that have asked, 
does this have to be an existing building if the and I'm going to preface this just based on my knowledge we have some cities that uh, will build buildings or they have uh, they have the opportunity to put in a building for you at very low cost or offset those as incentives um, speak to that does it have to be an existing building it does not have to be um, again my role is vice president of sales and marketing so I'm a sales guy and I, I value people's time and energy I, I I'd say to ask somebody to go about developing that build piece for us, that would be a, 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 a long reach to make this deal happen because I don't think we're gonna really wanna invest the time and energy in the development piece, um, but we'd certainly be open to it. Uh, you know, If I was weighing the opportunity on the build the suit side, I'd put that as a, a C or a D opportunity for us, for both, okay. probably both of us. So we've got David Bossamer. David's from West Plains, Missouri. Um, David's asking, is rail uh, important? He's asking, is it a must yep. or how heavy is it weighted into the, the component? No, rail's not a must. We do have rail siding in our current facility. It's nice to have. Um, and again, it going back to my point, it depends. You know, David, if, if it's the right opportunity and we were able to move material in and out, and I saw this question in a couple other places, we're, mature, we're moving material right now, primarily by truck, and um, almost none of our material leaves our facility by rail. The inbound piece is where rail is important. Um, yeah. Okay. What about uh, in terms of the building? Do you have a minimum ceiling height that you need? We do need overhead crane capacity, and you know existing cranes is, are, are important or the ability to have them. You know, so 18 feet is is nice um, okay but again we're moving steel overhead to manipulate perfect. perfect uh we've got mickey dean mickey's in junction city kansas uh also a great client of ours um how important are vendors in the area for your firm and what are the favored well, we kind of spoke to the transportation mode so speak yeah. more on the um the types of vendors or how important or proximity to those culturally Custom. yeah culturally as a company um the technology we need to make our widgets um is third three four five generations ago technology uh, we're still using interestingly a, a machine uh for drilling and tapping pieces that's nearly a hundred years old and so we maintain it because it's good enough for what we do the vendor piece is important uh, only in the standpoint that they're able to get to us, but I don't need immediate proximity. Okay. You're going to love this question. We dove into this yesterday. This is from Kim Little, and I want to thank Kim. She's from Coleman, Texas. She uh, hosted a couple of our people down there and gave us some tours of some buildings that I think are probably a pretty good fit for you uh, whenever we saw them. But she's asking, will you need any sandblast or paint booth capabilities? And again, is that a good tipping point? Kim, that's a, that's a great question. And I tell you, I use both in our facility today. It, it is not a, um, a must have for me to locate, but boy, it's great to see it because then I can bring some different manufacturing in and um, transit, trans, transfer some manufacturing there because I do need both the sand and the paint booth. Uh, for instance, right now I wet paint product and some of these products will actually make, send them right to the OEM who will bolt the product onto theirs and out it goes to the customer. Um, and by doing a wet paint application, that's just like you get at a collision shop for your car. Um, we've looked at powder coating and we outsource a fair amount of powder coating. If there was a powder coating booth out there inside one of these, you know, that's the kind of thing that we'd be like, holy cow, yeah, let's look at this opportunity in a different way than we looked at it when we started the conversation. Absolutely. We've got Don Provost. Uh, he's in Lubbock, Texas. I'm going to say wreck him. I'm a, I'm a former Red Raider. So <laughs> very form, uh, familiar with the area. And um, uh, he's asking, do you need a lay down or stack yard uh, space? The minimum expectation that we, that we would do in manufacturing doesn't call for it. But, you know, especially a great case of Texas here, um, 
the proximity to some manufacturing, the proximity to a port, uh, the proximity to now taking opportunity buys of material from outside of the United States, having stack or lay down space is, would be great. It would be great to have. Uh, it's not required. I have, like I said, 13 acres in our facility today. And um, a lot of that is lay down space. Yeah, and you and I have talked about this. Brad Reams, he's from Great Plains Industrial Park. Uh, we've really enjoyed working with their community. I um, saw their offer. Yeah, that looked neat. Stuff. Yeah, I was talking about port access. We've talked about rail. We've talked to things. Do, do, would port access um, be a, uh, a tipping point or a good, good addition? It is not a major part of our business today, simply because we don't have access to it. Um, I am importing some material in the Newark, New Jersey right now um, in a side business that we have unrelated to this, that there's no reason we couldn't incorporate that side business into a new facility to consolidate. Um, you know, it is. it was not on the list of must haves, but boy, if it were available with an opportunity or a deal, we'd, we'd certainly make use of it. Okay. We've got Larkin Simpson next. He's from central Louisiana. Hey, Larkin. Uh, and I also too, within the last couple of months, been out there to tour their, their community and, and meet with their, their key, key individuals there, really unique area. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you bring the materials in currently, sure. um, rail, water truck, and how do you, how do they go out? Yeah. So right now material comes in, um, by both truck and rail. Uh, and I'm talking about my standard day-to-day -day production stuff. 60% um, by truck, 40% by rail. Outbound, almost everything goes out by truck simply because if it's production and it's just in time delivery for the majority of our customers and we can't, can't function on that on rail. Okay. Uh, we've got Mary Lilly. She's out in North Carolina, Greenfield, North Carolina. Welcome. Um, do you use furnaces to melt your raw materials? Uh, no, ma'am. We, um, we simply fabricate and cut existing uh, steel. So we don't do any melting or pouring. You know, so if you, you're envisioning a big ladle with scraps and molten red, that ain't it. But um, if you were to envision and walk through our inventory fields, you'd see plates of steel starting at about three quarters of an inch thick, uh, 20 to 90 inches wide by 480 long or coils of steel. Um, you know, we also occasionally will process scrap on our yard. And, you know, that's a side piece um, that that is a, a part of our business as well, scrap metals processing. So with the right facility, there's no reason we couldn't locate a yard, create a yard there as well. Not a primary motivation today, but I pointed out simply as, you know, how we'd pounce on an opportunity or, you know, how we'd look at evaluate something to say, oh, wow, we, we could do something different there. I'm going to assume this, but I don't ever like to assume David asks, uh, is floor thickness a issue? It, it, it can be. Um, you can't, you can't have too thin a concrete uh, because of the, you know, the heavy steel we're going to be putting on it. And, you know, you heard early on, we're fabricating some 500,000 pound test weights. Now, rarely do we have 500,000 pounds on a square, you know, inside of the building that normally get assembled out. The, the maximum weight that we're ever dealing with in one particular handling is about 40,000 pounds because that's the constraint of rail or uh, trucking. Um, so that's, that's a good rule of thumb that we look at is what can handle 40,000 pounds. Occasionally you'll get a coil, occasionally get a plate of steel over that. Um, but as we build up our business, it's with that 40,000 pound handling in mind. Okay. So we, uh, we're going to go south a little bit uh, to Yvette Sanchez. She's down in Laredo. Uh, very familiar with Laredo, good yeah. client of ours also. Um, are you sourcing anything from Mexico? You know, no, uh, not right now. And uh, typically uh, the cost structure of the steel manufacturing process doesn't lend itself to bringing material in from Mexico. Okay. 
Now, this is a good question. Uh, Cindy, thank you for this question. She's from Liberal, Kansas. Uh, I've known Cindy for, gosh, man, 10, 15 years now. Um, but Cindy's asking, does it matter? Uh, are you in a preference? Do you want to buy or do you want to lease your building? Uh, yes. <laughs> it, it, it depends, man. You're going to, I told you, Eric, you'd hate me at the end of this because it's, it depends. Uh, we're in a position to buy and um, we're happy to lease as well if it's not the perfect fit to see how it works. Okay. I've got a question here from Jennifer Say. Um, and she's asking if, if they if the community does put together the right deal on a build to suit, what's the acreage, minimum acreage that you need? Uh, well and I guess that goes into what size yeah. building you're putting on it. Jennifer, I, I don't have a great answer for you other than to tell you that the deal we envisioned that made me respond and work with Brooke was that 20 to 50,000 square foot facility with cranes that I could do um, metal fabrication in. Um, you don't need a ton of footprint outside of that, but um, you know, again, you start getting into the difference of, and we talk about this and how we do our business, the difference between resale and wholesale and, or uh, not, not resale, but retail and wholesale. You know, you start looking at build to me, it's, it, you're starting to talk about retail costs and I'm really looking for wholesale. Okay. And just so you know, Jennifer, she's uh, from the Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia area. Oh. So over on the East Coast. Oh. My favorite place to be. I love Virginia. <laughs> um, got a question here from, let me see. Let's go to Pamela next. Uh, do you need a gas line, sewer? How many trucks per day do you, do you anticipate? Sometimes that's a, that's a consideration for how a, a particular area is zoned in a community. Sure. Um, so yeah, I need we'd need all of those uh, those facilities in. We'd need gas because um, heating. The, well, again, you can tell I'm a northeast guy because uh, I the first thing I want to talk about is heat because um, it's freaking cold up here right now. It's it's 18 <laughs> degrees, but um, yeah, the utilities are important and the ability to draw um, the energy that we would need. Uh, we need uh, an ability to put an oxygen tank up for the burning. Uh, we'd need the ability for gas for, for heating and typically running a paint booth if we decide to do that. Um, I'm looking here uh, for that question, so I hit all the things that you, that was asked. Um, yeah. What uh, else? No, we can go over to Nita McDaniel. Uh, she's from Monticello, Arkansas. Um, she's talking I, about the uh, is. It, if the building, it doesn't matter if it doesn't yes, matter if it's metal fabricated or masonry. No, the only the only issue becomes, um, you know, the ability to support a crane. You know, as long as the crane bridge is in there, and as long as the ability to move the material, because again, everything does have to be moved by crane. Or, well, we so I can't imagine running our business without a crane. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you talked, you had several cranes in your current one. Go ahead and uh, refresh us on the ceiling height. That's one of the questions they were asking. Yeah, yeah. Again, I would think 18 feet is the minimum um, that we'd want to be. Uh, there's no maximum. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess expand a little bit. Mary Lilly from Electra Cities would like you to expand a little bit on the configuration of the building. How long a bay do you need for your equipment? any outdoor silos, that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, huh. And that's, that's a fair question that I, I, I I'm going to have to circle back to give you an exact minimum. Um, what I would tell you is when we began our business, uh, we started in L configured uh, with short and goofy bays so that we have flexibility based on what we're doing to work around angles. Um, Ideally, it's one long run, but again, because we were, and we started up this business, we were driven by the deal. We we truly were catch it, catch can throughout the, the facility. So Perfect. we have the ability to work around it. Now, when we were talking, did you say your current facility is in an opportunity zone? Kim Little mentions down in Coleman uh, that they're in an opportunity zone. Is your current facility in an opportunity zone? And is that, I mean, that's obviously a, a, a potential for the city to offer you uh, a better deal. It is. We're in an opportunity zone now. Uh, we, the only time we take advantage of that is um, for government contracts uh, to to acquire selling opportunities. We've not 
we've not taken any of the opportunities that the cities that the city has offered uh, through the opportunity zones. Uh, here's a little uh, little tipping point from Mary Lilly. Um, we were talking about paint booths and those types of things. If it had an existing truck scale, is that an advantage? It is. It is very much so because everything has to get weighed on the way in and everything gets weighed on the way out. But okay. converse, conversely, I can use a truck stop too up the street. Uh, okay. Perfect. Uh, Linda Frost. Um, pretty good question. Uh, what, what, what is your time frame? What is your motivation um, in terms of uh, when the right deal comes, are you, are you pushing to make this happen by end of year? What are you thinking? No, we're, um, we're opportunity motivated here. As I mentioned at the start, our business is serving the country right now from our Northeast location. What we don't know is what we don't know about being somewhere South. Um, we are an expansion point of our business. Uh, we do need to grow and we are ready to go and take action as soon as that opportunity presents. Perfect. Larkin wants to kind of know um, in terms of um, additional kind of requirements as they think about the existing yeah. inventory they have, office space, parking spaces, truck docks, paint a little bit of a better picture for that. Sure. I don't anticipate moving um, headquarter kind of facilities or uh, needs. So office space would be minimal. Um, handful of people, maybe, well, the, this 125 people that we have in our facility now, uh, we operate with a management team and an administrative team of about 14. Um, we anticipate being able to handle the majority of those administrative needs from a central location. Um, but I would expect at least a half a dozen non-production type folks to come along eventually. Okay, great. I, I, now, look, I'm sorry. I'm thinking if I do that to scale of what we are today, if we open in a 20 to 50,000 square foot, a typical one or two room office setup, it'd be fine. Um, but we wouldn't be afraid of a giant office spot too. Okay, great. We've got Milton, Jennifer, and Mary. They're kind of asking the same question. We've addressed this, um, and it seems like we have a lot of port cities on here today, which is which is um, interesting. Um, again, port, uh, speak to the uh, availability of using a barge and things like that, and we can answer all three of those at once. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, that's one of the things we kick ourselves about, not having the, the bandwidth and the guts to do something with that Arkansas facility way back when because it was right on the river and there was barge access. Uh, it does give us some flexibility and there is interest in it because we would be able to utilize barge. Okay. Um, pretty much the last question here from Cindy. And this is kind of what I alluded to at the beginning of the, the call. We've got a lot of smaller cities that aren't right on the interstate and, but they do have access uh, to, to multiple areas based on their thing. Do you have a need for four lane access, two lane, um, and, you know, does that hinder their chances of uh, you taking a look if the right, if the right deals there? We would take a look at the right in, right deals there. The, the constraining piece to the company or the, the city, I would imagine, would be the amount of truck traffic that could be coming in, carrying steel in and out. Um, I think that was a question asked earlier. Uh, boy, in some days we'll see 35, 40 trucks come in over the course of the day, flatbeds. Um, and then another 15 go out, uh, you know, and that that's, I gave you the worst case scenario. If we, and again, that it depends if we had a great opportunity to buy material, but it all had to leave in the, in a, a week's period. Well, there's a ton of trucks rolling in over that, that following week. Yeah. But, um, you know, so if the city's infrastructure could support flatbed trucks rolling in and out uh, with steel, rarely ever a wide load, um, then yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, perfect. I think we've answered all of our questions. Uh, if you have any other questions, now's the time to throw them in really quick and, and we'll get to them. But uh, we're coming up on our, our time for the day. And uh, again, I want to really give my uh, thanks to you and, and all the communities that are, that are here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the submissions now. 
Um, we're going to be starting ac accepting submissions as soon as we get off this um, project live um, call. I'm going to post up a poll, and this will help us also capture um, your email, and we'll send you immediately a email uh, with a link to a submission form, uh, which you can. You can also go to our portal and uh, peruse the leads, find a project metal fab and, and claim it and, and do your submissions from there. But uh, I just launched the poll. Um, if you are interested in submitting to the project, go ahead and click yes. And we'll, we'll make note and start uh, gathering a file uh, for Pat and uh, uh, we'll go from there, but we will be accepting submissions till February 5th at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. At that point, that's where we sit down, uh, put together all the submissions and start filtering through and working with them. Um, when you submit with us, you'll be contacted by our one of our community assessment coaches um, that'll work with you, make sure that uh, the submission is exactly what um, we're looking for and will help uh, enhance your chances of getting on the short list. At that point, Pat will be taking a, a look at those. And from there, we'll begin setting up site visits um, and um, uh, touring some of the available properties and looking at, at some of the opportunities. Um, this last page, if you want to screen capture it or, or save it, uh, these are our contact information. Uh, myself, uh, Brooke, who's our project manager, does a lot of the interfacing and and a coordination of the submissions to uh, the projects. Amanda is one of our great coaches uh, that works several states in the United States and will help you get your submissions in. And Carol Harris is another one of our coaches. And uh, they do a lot of work of making sure that your submission is uh, something of use. But uh, with that said, um, don't forget, uh, we do have a project, another project live coming up with Bon Appetit February 11th at, 11, at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. You will get notices and, and um, um, uh, alerts of when that one's going to happen that you can sign up for. But again, Pat, thank you so much for your time today. I, I know you're a busy guy and you've been more than generous with your time with us of expanding this, uh, your project needs. And hopefully this will help uh, shorten that now because now we've got all the answers and people can refer to these. Uh, we will uh, be posting this live on our website. We'll also be doing a transcription of it. So if you're a community and wanna walk, look at the transcription and go through uh, the notes, um, she'll be busy for the next 48 hours typing this up. And we always appreciate her services and to the communities. Uh, I know you're busy uh, with all the challenges our cities have right now of, of uh, keeping their local businesses going while they're trying to attract businesses. And we want to thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, Project Live event. So with that said, thanks a lot. And we're signing off till next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.